السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي بنعمته تتم الصالحات والصلاة والسلام على أفضل البرايا وسيد الكائنات نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا Praise be to Allah alone We praise him and we seek his help Whomsoever Allah guides is a truly guided one and whomsoever Allah leaves us ray no one can show him guidance May the best peace and blessings be upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Dear brothers and sisters, welcome to a new edition of Ask Huda. The phone number is area code 0020238552482448 or 249 and the email address is ask at huda.tv. I begin as usual by uh, answering some of the pending questions. Amir from the United Arab Emirates asked about a cousin who is the only breadwinner at his house and he works at a bank so the only money available for them is not halal what's your advice Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجَ وَيَرْزُقُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ this is a divine promise in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and whosoever fears Allah by fulfilling what he commanded and abstaining from whatever he prohibited and keeps his duties to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, مَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ as a result of this taqwa and fear and fulfilling the obligations, يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجَ Allah will give him a way out of every hardship, a relief from every burden. وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ and will provide for him indeed from ways which he could never expect. Since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Ar-Razzaq Dhul Quwwati Al-Mateen Ar-Razzaq is an extensive form. He does not only provide, but He is constantly providing. And no provision that reaches us, but only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So no one should try to seek the provision by disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Working in a conventional bank is absolutely prohibited. And this is one of the major sins because the person will be dealing with riba and facilitating that. And the Prophet ﷺ said, لَعَنَ اللَّهُ الرِّبَا آكِلَهُ وَمُؤْكِلَهُ وَكَاتِبَهُ وَشَاهِدَيْهِ May Allah curse uh, the usury and its dealing and those who pay it and those who collect it and those who write it down in a contract as bankers for innocence and the witnesses. So that leaves no room for us to say, I have an excuse. Yet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran permitted us to eat the dead meat. If, if it is a matter of saving one's life. Or to drink wine, if it is a matter of saving one's life. إِلَّا إِلَيْهِ So during the cases of necessity, it becomes permissible with two conditions. فَمَنِ اضْطُرَّ فِي مَخْمَصَةٍ غَيْرَ مُتَجَانِفٍ لِإِثْمٍ فَمَنِ اضْطُرَّ غَيْرَ بَاغٍ وَلَا عَادٍ فَلَا إِثْمَ عَلَيْهِ Necessity requires that the person does not do it willingly and whenever he has to do it, he will do it with a limit. If he does not pay the rent, him and his family members will be kicked out. So he only works in order to suffice his basic needs, not to grow his business not to make some saving, and so on. It is much better for a person to work in the flea market, or to sell items in the streets, or to work on an unemployment welfare, to, uh, on the, to live on the unemployment welfare, than work in, in a haram, because the Prophet ﷺ said, كُلُّ جَسَدٍ نَبَتَ مِنْ فَالنَّارُ أَوْلَى بِهِ And Allah promises, if you are God-fearing, he will provide for you from ways which you could never expect. One should not question Allah's uh, uh, wisdom and how. And by every mean, it's not possible because it is up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
once you take the initiative. So if it is the necessity that you're going through right now and there is no mean whatsoever of helping, then you can take this job with a limit and try your best to look for a lawful job. Wallahu ta'ala a'la wa a'lam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Umm Maryam from uh, Kuwait. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Sheikh, I have a question. Please go ahead. Uh, I, I want to know what is the Sharia lo- uh, ruling on a wife staying with her in, with his husband's uh, in-laws, like, I mean, husband's family. Can she uh, uh, ask for a separate accommodation? The in-law you mean, of course, your brother's in-law, not uh, your parents' in-law, right? No, my mother-in-law and... Okay. Yeah. Okay, I got your question. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Umu Maria. Yeah. Uh, Farhan from United Arab Emirates as well asked about the medical insurance provided by a company. We don't uh, know if it is a Sharia compliant or not. Uh, we discussed this repeatedly and we said any commercial based insurance is haram. It's a done deal. Only the cooperative insurance, which is formed by a group of people working in a syndicate or in an organization to help one another, that is permissible. And furthermore, it is praiseworthy. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَتَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَى Help one another to achieve righteousness and piety. Okay. If uh, this health insurance is provided by the company and it is optional, and I ask this question in order to clarify whether you have to pay monthly fees or not to the company in order to subscribe in that. In the conclusion, I figured out that it was optional. Meaning you have to pay monthly fees. It's, it doesn't come with a package. So in this case, if you choose so, that means you chose to sign up with a contract that is haram because of the previous reasons that we discussed repeatedly. Um, Omar from Nigeria had a couple of very interesting questions. The first one was asking about a couple who established an illicit relationship. And he said, a secret relationship, uh, we have to clarify that. If you are talking about fornication and adultery, then the answer will be as follows. He said, can they still proceed with the marriage? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah An-Nur in verse number 3, الزاني لا ينكح إلا زانية أو مشرك والزانية لا ينكحها إلا زان أو مشرك وحرم ذلك على المؤمنين The adulterer marries not but an adulteress or a مشركة and the adulteress marries not but an adulterer or a مشرك means one who agrees to marry to an adulterer He's either an adulterer, uh, marries to an adulteress, he's either an adulterer or a musha. So the scholar said it is not permissible to marry one who has been involved in a sexual relationship outside marriage unless if she repents, unless if they both repent. If somebody who is not involved in this relationship and he knew that this woman was establishing such uh, illegal, illegitimate relationship, and he wants to marry her, if she repented and her tawbah is sincere, in this case the scholar said it is permissible. But with a sincere tawbah that she declares that she repented and she committed that by mistake, she recognized her sin and she vows not to ever think about it again. What if this happens within the first month after establishing such a relationship? It is not permissible to just say I repented, then go ahead and get married. That happens a lot, unfortunately, among the youth in America and Europe, where if he wants to marry, marry a girl, uh, a local girl, who uh, broke up with a boyfriend just uh, a week or two ago, we say no, because there is something called baraatul rahim, in order to verify whether she is pregnant or not. Because if she is pregnant, then it is not permissible to marry her at all, whether she repented or not, not unless and until she delivers the baby. She's already pregnant. 
So it is not permissible for you to marry one who is pregnant. Whether pregnancy due to marriage, and the husband divorced her, or she died, or he died, or due to having an outside marriage sexual relationship. Okay? So the previous conditions have to be fulfilled. Sincere tawbah and bara'at ar-rahim. And my advice is one should look for al-muhsana, the chaste woman. This is what one should look for. The mother of your children. Not only the mother for your children, but also the family. Who's going to be your kids' uncles? Who's going to be your parents-in-law? What kind of environment your wife or your husband is living in? These are very important factors have to be considered and taken in mind. Uh, Hajira from India. Assalamu alaikum. Hajira. Brother, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, brother, I have two questions. Please proceed on. Yeah. Uh, in India, we believe that there is a lot of black magic being practiced. Uh, how do we know if someone has done black magic on us? And uh, how can we get rid of it? Uh, is there any religious scholar whom we should approach to ward off black magic? Okay. Uh, my second question is, my husband is having hard time in his job since a long time. Uh, any particular surahs to be decided to increase our sustenance? What kind of hard time you having? Is he working or is he let off? Hajra? Hello? Uh, what kind of hard time that he's having? Is he still working or he's laid off? No, uh, he's still working rather. But he's not getting the salary. So he's working but he's not getting the salary. Okay, w where is he working? Yeah, he's working now. Where? Okay, Hajra, Jazakumullah wa khairan. Thank you. Fairs from uh, Oman. Assalamu alaikum. How are you, brother? Alhamdulillah. How are you, sir? Great. Alhamdulillah. Wa sir, I have one question. Please proceed. Yeah, uh, regarding the situation, the Tuesday situation, the crisis going on everywhere in Muslim countries, especially. Hmm. My question it is not the ploy of the enemies to destroy the Muslim Ummah. And they are taking the support of the Shiite to destroy the Sunni. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Thank you, Fayouz, for my man. I understand where you're coming from. Inshallah, hopefully we'll get to answer your question. Uh, Omar's second question is, what is the ruling on someone who works on a ship and dies at sea? How do you treat the body? He also mentioned that uh, the ship will not land before six months, so it will take them six months. Obviously, we're talking about the 21st century, where definitely ships now are equipped with freezers and refrigerators and means to preserve the body. And I don't think a ship would sail from uh, North America to India or um, to the Middle East in more than one month, obviously. So if it is possible to preserve the body until the recent or the closest Muslim cemetery where the person will be buried, then we will resort to that. But if it is as you say, which I cannot imagine it's happening today that uh, the sailors have to sail for so long, for several months without landing, uh, landing at any shore. And they don't have a refrigerator to preserve the body of the deceased, and there is a fear that it may decay and smell and rotten, then we will resort to the old-fashioned, what the scholars said in the past, our predecessors would uh, wash the disease of uh, the person, uh, the regular ghost, and wrap him in the proper shroud or coffin. Then they would tie him to a heavy weight, then they will lower his body to the ocean or to the sea, so that he will rest in the bottom and his body would not flow. Wallahu ta'ala a'la a'la. But once again, I believe this is a hypothetical a case or from the past because now every ship they, uh, they, they, they land at certain 
ports in order to refuel and take a break. So if there is a possibility to bury the person in the nearest Muslim cemetery, then we will have to do that. Jazakallah khairan ya Umar. Um Muhiba also asked about, is it permissible for a woman whose husband uh, died and she's on her idda to attend tafsir courses? Yesterday I mentioned the hadith of Um Habiba in which she said, and the hadith is a sound hadith collected by Imam al-Bukhari, that it is not permissible for a person who believes in Allah and in the last day to mourn the death of any person beyond three days except a wife mourning the death of her husband. It must be four months and ten days. And that requires the hidad or mourning the death of one's husband require number one, she should reside in the house in which her husband died or in which he died while she was staying at. Say that he was traveling outside or abroad or he died in some other country. In the house which she was living at the time, she must stay there for four months and ten days. Does not leave her house except for a necessity and during the day. She's not even allowed to travel to perform Hajj or Umrah or move to live with other people unless if she was an old woman who needs assistance and no one close by to assist her. These are exceptions. Aw or darurat which permit whatever is restricted. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in verse number 234 of Surah Al-Baqarah, وَالَّذِينَ يُتَوَفَّوْنَ مِنْكُمْ وَيَذَرُونَ أَزْوَاجًا يَتَرَبَّصْنَ بِأَنفُسِهِنَّ أَرْبَعَةَ أَشْهُرٍ وَعَشْرًا This verse number 234 indicated that the idda, the waiting period for a widow whose husband died is four months and ten days. She is not allowed during this time to wear any fragrance, any adornment or any jewelry or any attractive clothes. And that indicates how much, uh, how great is the value of the husband in the life of his wife. That she does not even mourn the death of her father more than three days. And when Umm Habiba narrated this, she asked for some sufra to wear in order to break the mourning and not to exceed three days because the Prophet ﷺ, for the death of her father, Abu Sufyan, because the Prophet ﷺ said so. By the way, this idda for the widow, for months and ten days, could be longer, and it could be shorter. How? If the woman was pregnant at the time, so the idda will be delivering the baby or giving birth. If she gives birth, once the husband dies, and even before burying him, the idda is over, and she will be permitted even to remarry. But, if she does not give birth until eight or nine months later, then the idda, which was four months and ten days, is stretched until she delivers. Because a companion, a lady companion by the name Subayatul Aslamiyya, delivered her baby 15 days after her husband died, and the Prophet ﷺ allowed her to remarry if she wanted to. Wallahu ta'ala, a'la alam. Another phone call. Sister Ummu Muslim from Nigeria, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam, Sheikh. How are you? Fine, thank you. I asked two questions last week. You answered only one part of it. I just forgot the second part. Which was it? I said, is it this permissible to work in a court that does not apply the Sharia law? In a court does not apply the Sharia law. Okay, okay. Yes. Let me answer this question right now. Working as a cleaner or uh, a supervisor, not necessarily as a lawyer. But okay. Other of mm. work. If the job is limited to working as a janitor or a constructor uh, uh, guy, then uh, I believe, and Allah knows best, there is no burden or such person. But if he is a judge, who has to rule by ruling other than what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stated in the book, that is haram, it's, it's not permissible. Or if he's a lawyer who is involved in a case in order to defend a criminal, or undermine the ruling of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he too is liable and this is haram. But since there has to be a court, whether with a, a divine law, or the sharia, or a man-made law, people have to take their cases to the court. So a janitor, or a cleaner 
is not directly involved. So hopefully, inshallah, there's no blame on him. Yet, if he can find a different job, which is 100% halal, of course it will be best to resort to a different job. Okay? Thank you, Ummu Muslim. Uh, Brother Kishwar from United Arab Emirates, can I offer nafila prayer as many raka as I can? Yes, but if it is a night prayer, then you should end up with an odd prayer, which is the witch. Uh, it is best if you limit it to what the Prophet ﷺ used to do, 11 raka at night, long and perfect them. But somebody who wants to pray all night long, does not recite, uh, recite much Qur'an, or does not memorize much Qur'an, so he, he prayed 20 or 30 or 40 raka'ah, that is permissible too. But by the end, do not forget to pray which. Dina from Egypt, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, Dr. Muhammad? Alhamdulillah, thank you for asking. Alhamdulillah, uh, I have three questions if you don't mind. Please proceed with your questions. My first question is regarding uh, the prayer of rain. Can it be done individually with the congregation? Okay. And my second question is regarding nafla or fasting voluntarily, mm. like uh, Mondays and Thursdays. We don't need the intention uh, for, uh, like... Um, to proceed fasting with the intention. So if you get up at noon, uh, or 11 or so, and... Uh, you intend to fasting, would that be permissible? Is this your question? Yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah. Okay, go ahead. My third question is the ruling of medicine that contains alcohol in it. Is it allowed? Uh, uh, what is it? Medicine. Medicine, uh, okay. That contains uh, alcohol. Okay. Small amount. Yeah. Small amount, okay. Thank you, Dina. Jazakum <coughs> Brother Awal from Nigeria, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Amin wa alaikum wa salam, brother. Please proceed with your questions. Uh, yeah, my question is, my question is, uh, what about this? There is a debate that I watched between uh, Mr. Ahmed Tijat. May Allah have mercy on him. Rosh. And uh, Anis Rosh posed a question regarding and fasting during Ramadan, that if the Prophet has been sent to the whole of me, why is he asked to fast right, the concept? Since there are some people in the part of the world who uh, experience... You, uh, you, yeah, Awal, Awal, your voice is breaking off. I cannot hear you clearly, okay? I guess you're talking about fasting during Ramadan in a debate between uh, Ahmed Didat, may Allah mercy on him, and another person. But the question is not clear. If you, if you can call and back and, and give them the question to the controller, I would appreciate that. Okay, and I'll collect it during the break, inshallah. Okay? Um, I'm going on Umrah besides prayer and dua. What can I do? Every time that you spend in the haram is a ibadah by itself. Contemplating, uh, reflecting, making adhkar, making dua, Tawaf, voluntary tawaf, is one of the greatest ibadat. And remember, it requires whatever the salah requires of the tahara, covering the awrah. And it doesn't have a specific time. You can perform tawaf at any time of the day. Except whenever there is a prayer that you should cease and pray, then resume your tawaf afterward. But there is no voluntary sa'i. So you can do tawaf as many times as you can. And this is what I advise those who are going for umrah with. Especially nowadays, they have the luxury or performing Umrah, uh, and it is not that crowded, mashallah. <clears throat> um, Amir from United Arab Emirates said he has a relative who works for a travel agency that sells packages that include belly dancing. Is it halal or haram? The answer is obviously clear that participating in anything that is haram or leads to haram is haram. So selling packages or tickets where people will attend things, that is haram. That job is haram as well. And your earning accordingly will be haram. And one should not facilitate such thing. Man istanna sunnatan sayyatan fa'alayhi uzruha wa wizru man amila biha 
إلى يوم القيامة. Samira from Norway, and this is the last of the pending questions. Is it permissible to marry a second wife during the idda period of the divorce of the first wife? Yes, if he was only married to one or two or three. But if he was married to four and divorced one, it is not permissible for him to remarry until the idda of his divorcee is over because she is still officially his wife. If he marries during the idda, is considered like he's married to five. Wallahu ta'ala a'la wa a'lam. I will try to remember Ammu Maryam's question from Kuwait. But she was asking about uh, the, 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 the parents-in-law. And the Sharia ruling concerning her parents-in-law father and mother-in-law living with her in the same house. I like to see this straight from the beginning via an agreement. There are certain cultures, the indo pak for innocence, they're used to that. Okay? Uh, in some Arabic uh, cultures, it creates problems. So the wife requires that I, have, I should have my independent housing. And that's her right. But here is a question, what if things pop up such as now the parents have no one whatsoever to look after them? Will we deposit the parents in a nursing home? Do like Americans, do like Westerns, do like non-Muslims? Obviously not. This is a time to pay back some, some of what we owe to our parents. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that رغم أنف عبد may one lose and may, be hum- may he be humiliated if he witnesses the life of his parents or one of them أدرك أبواه الكبر أو أدرك أبويه الكبر أو أحدهما either one of them or both of them get old in his life and does not get to enter paradise through serving them. Which means, you're lucky. You're very, very lucky if you have your parents living with you, and you can look after them, and serve them. Abdullah ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, not that somebody was performing tawaf, and carrying his mother on his shoulders. So that was very impressive. The guy said to Abdullah ibn Umar, أَتُرَانِي قَدْ وَفَّيْتُهَا حَقَّهَا Do you think I've paid her enough or I've paid her back? He said, no. Not even equivalent to one scream that she screamed while giving birth to you. She bore you in weakness above weakness. وَهْنًا عَلَى وَهْنًا And nine months pregnancy and two years breastfeeding Changing the diaper, looking after you. If you get sick all night, she's awake. And the father is working hard to raise you guys. And after all, ask them to go to a nursing home or pay a maid to look after them. Both the couple, the husband and wife, have to be in the same page and understand that through serving them, they have an easy access to Al-Jannah. And the husband has to play the wisest role in this regard. Because sometimes the husband uh, gives precedence to his parents and tries to put down his wife. Of course I would give precedence to my parents, but I would not put down my wife. I would appreciate that she's serving them and she's working hard in order to honor them. So that has to be appreciated too, on a regular basis. By complimenting the wife, by buying her gifts, by understanding that she's doing a, a very noble service to my parents, so I should not upset her by any mean. I should thank her on a regular basis. If I can take her out and get, find some help, like a maid or a servant or somebody to help at home, these are all means. But if the husband is only taking the parent's side and is putting down the wife, what do you expect? A kiosk at home. So the husband has to wisen up and have to understand that in order to keep balance, it is not easy. But since... He is fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he's trying his utmost to maintain his marriage life. Meanwhile, serve his parents. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help him out and will facilitate that for him. And sister, please remember one thing. 
I normally say every time I get the same question. If you are a mother, or you're going to be a mother, then certainly in a few years, you will be a mother-in-law. And whatever you wished for your parents-in-law, you're going to receive. The same treatment that you were given to your parents-in-law, you're going to receive. So basically, it's a credit towards your future. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring peace and tranquility to your family and make you both enter al-jannah through serving uh, your parents-in-law. Wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. A short break and inshallah we'll return back very soon, so stay tuned. So this is something that you have to point out to the to them in the Bible. Something which is, I think, very rarely needed by the youth, which is uh, staying firm on the truth. This is just one of the greatest examples for me of how to control your anger. Within the framework of, of being the cleanest religion, the cleanest jurisprudence, and in the meantime, uh, uh, the kindest religion to animals. Watch Let's Talk with Khalil Amanet as he interviews guests and discusses a variety of topics, everything from youth issues to religious issues. Join us here on Hoda TV. programs can be watched in the English section of the in-flight entertainment directory on board all Saudi airline flights, domestic and international. Sit back, relax and enjoy watching Hoda's entertaining and enlightening shows on your trip. Hoda wishes you a safe and successful journey. Hoda, a light in every home. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Uh, Sister Hajra from India said that it is common in her society the practice of the black magic. Uh, first of all, uh, in getting involved in the magic activities by casting a magical spell against somebody in order to hurt him or her or by asking somebody, hiring somebody to cast a magical spell against somebody else is equivalent to kufr and disbelief. This is entirely haram. وَمَا يُعَلِّمَانِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ حَتَّى يَقُولَ إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ فِتْنَةٌ فَلَا تَكْفُرُ The two angels, Harut and Marut, who came, whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tried people with, via teaching people sorcery in order to warn them against it and say this is prohibited, said they do not teach in a person but they say we are just a trial, do not utilize this, do not go in this direction, do not follow sihr and magic, فَلَا takfur. So this is equivalent to kufr. One who visits a sorcerer or a fortune teller and seeks their help, has disbelieved in whatever was revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So we have to understand, this is not just a simple sin, or just a major sin, this is equivalent to kufr, it is a disbelief. That should not even cross our mind, that we can ever use this. I will continue to answer your question, after I take the following two phone calls. Uh, Fatima from Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, how are you, Shaykh? Alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking. Yes. 
first of all, I would like to appreciate whatever you're doing through this uh, television network. Thank you. Jazakumullah khairan. In the end, yes, I, I feel I have in the end found some light uh, in, uh, in, in my religion, alhamdulillah. May Allah accept. But, um, um, I, I actually have a question regarding um, um, misconce min misconceptions and confusions. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I belong from Pakistan, and, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of, you know, different sects that are being followed um, uh, in Pakistan, the different aqidah, mm -hmm. aqidah groups. Uh, well, I, I strongly believe in what Allah says in the Quran, like, atiyu Allah wa atiyu Rasul wa la tuptilu amalakum. But I feel that uh, there are misconceptions, like, where people say that, um, uh, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is alive, or no, he is dead, or you know uh, that uh, we are we, we can ask uh, we can go to the uh, uh, memorials of the Waliullah and we can you know ask for we can ask them to pray for us. We don't actually worship them, and you know so many things like that. I, I, I'm sure that you know about these things about yeah. these concepts. But my question is like uh, uh, these different sects they don't. Pray, you know, behind each other because they say that if the aqidah is different from our aqidah, then according to the Hanafi school of thought, we are not supposed to pray behind the imam of different aqidah. Yeah. Because I know many of um, my relatives and friends, they don't, you know, they, they go to uh, the, uh, the, they visit Makkah and they visit Medina Munawwara, but they don't pray behind the imam of Kaaba and the uh, Masjid al Nabawi. Really? So, uh, yes. And, and this is um, actually a very, very uh, uh, famous, uh, you know, the thing that is going on these days that they don't, they don't pray behind those imams. Yeah. So that worries me a lot. You know, there are thousands of questions regarding these misconceptions and confusions. But I think I can start up with this particular question: that how are we supposed to describe the aqidah, and what are the, you know, the the the, the main points that that we are supposed to, you know. Um, uh, keep in mind uh, when praying behind imams, if they are of different aqidah. Okay. Ha, ha, Thank ha. you. Uh, Ali from Canada. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you, Sheikh? Wonderful. Alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking. How about yourself? Alhamdulillah. Good. I bet you it's very cold there. Thank you. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> I thank you, Sheikh, for all your efforts for the spread of the truth and haq. Alhamdulillah, uh, thank you. Jazakallah khair. And we all love you for all your efforts uh, in the sake of Allah. For May the Allah love you as well. Ameen. I would like to clarify regarding uh, going in the path of Allah as some of the people tell us in the masjids, for example, for three days, ten days, forty days, like that. And some of them say that it is zunub if you do not go out with them yeah. and make us feel guilty that if we don't go out for the specific period of time, so, what is the opinion of the ulama or the scholars in this regard? Okay, Ali, inshallah, will answer this question, but since it was asked tons of times, it's actually posted in writing on our website, but inshallah, we'll get to answer it, inshallah. I don't think this episode, because we have a, a, a long list of pending questions. Okay? Uh -huh, but if I, I'd like to have an answer to it because uh, I'm quite keen to know about it. I will, inshallah, but I don't think it will be answered during the remaining time of this uh, edition because uh, we answer the questions in the same order they were received. If I get a chance, I will, inshallah. Please. Uh, thank okay. you very much. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, Sister Aziza from Nigeria. Uh, Nafisa, Nafisa from Nigeria. Nafisa from Nigeria, okay. Assalamu alaikum, Nafisa. Wa alaikum salam. How are you, Sheikh? Alhamdulillah, thank you for asking. For a long time, I've been looking forward to speak to you. I'm sorry, I apologize. Uh, Sheikh, for a long time, I've been looking forward to talk to you on Aksuda. Okay. Yeah. Please, I just want to ask about children. What about them? Uh, yeah. Um, it, when you have a child doing things that are not good, I don't know how to bring him back in a last way and all those... In, in, in what sense, Nafisa? They're not good in what sense? Uh, hello? They're not good in what sense? Um, selling life and doing what he's not supposed to do. 
Mm. How old? He doesn't pray, and he's just uh, 14 years. I don't know how. Oh, so how 14 years. Yes. At the listen age. Okay. Okay, Sister Nafisa, thank you. Now, what is the remedy for black magic, if there is any? And also, what are the means of protection? They are the same of the remedy. But before I tackle any of them, I don't want my beloved brothers and sisters to live in that environment or feeling that anything goes wrong, that it must be a magical spell. If I'm having a problem with my boss, there must be a magical spell. If I fail to get married, it must be a magical spell. No, this is not the case. Not necessarily. Number one, قَدَّرَ اللَّهُ Whatever takes place in our lives is simply because of Allah's decree. And the magical spell will not change anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained. That mankind and the jinn, if they all gather together to harm any person with anything that was not preordained for him, they would never do so. And the opposite is true. If mankind and the jinn gather together to benefit any person with anything, to give him one moment extra in his life, to make him marry a girl that they all want him to marry, which is not ordained for him in the record, in the preserved tablet, it will never take place. رُفِعَةِ uh, الْأَقْلَامِ uh, وَجَفَّةُ uh, الصُّحُفِ uh, As the Prophet ﷺ said, the pens which were recorded in our destiny uh, have been left and the scriptures or the tablet has dried up nothing can it change it this is the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the best means of protection is al muawwidat the last three chapters of the Quran in the morning and in the evening before going to sleep you recite them three times and you blow in your palms thrice and you wipe over your head face and as far as you can reach of your body Ayatul Kursi, the greatest mean of protection again is the evil eye, the black magic, magical spell, or you name it. Okay? Surah Al Baqarah. And you can recite certain verses which we stated before, Surah Al Araf and, and others in Surah Al Baqarah. You recite them on a, a, a water container, then you drink from this water, you perform wudu, or you wash your body with this water. These are all means of uh, removing the magical spell, insha'Allah, and also uh, uh, the evil eye, protection against the evil eye. If any of us adheres to reciting the morning and the evening invocations on a regular basis, that would be the best, and insha'Allah nothing would hurt you, nothing would harm you. These supplications are not one or two or three, it's a nice list of supplications consist of Quranic verses and as invocations have been prescribed by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for instance reciting in the morning three times Bismillah al-Ladhi la yadurru ma'a smihi shay'un fil ardi wa la fil samai wa huwa al-sami'u al-alim in the name of Allah with whose name nothing would hurt nor harm in the heavens or the earth and he is the all-hearer the all-knowing if you if recite that Nothing would hurt you throughout the entire day, except if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed for you death, and so on. These supplications are all included in the booklet, which I advise everybody to keep in his or her pocket all the time, to frequently recite this ad'iya until you memorize them. It is called the Fortress of the Believer, and it is available in bookstores. As far as Fayyuz's question from Oman, who said that don't you think that the revolutions which are taking over uh, the entire Middle East and the Muslim countries uh, are pre-planned uh, or these are plots by the West to make a separation or form a Shia uh, sectarian area versus Sunni and make them overcome. All of that is possible. You expect everything from these guys. Their intelligence are spending trillions of dollars, working day and night, plotting against Islam and Muslims. We have no problem with that. Everybody knows that. It's no secret. They declare that, uh, not just in the WikiLeaks, but in their reports, which they release every once in a while. 
our role as Muslims is number one to cling to the Quran and the Sunnah to adhere to our Sharia ah, to be united around the robe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what has happened in Egypt even if it was pre-planned by others so what? we need to benefit out of that we got rid of the tyrant in Libya likewise in Tunisia likewise and the rest still to come but to begin a new beginning to recognize that we have been oppressed and these guys were big thieves and these guys were serving their masters to oppress their people and they were acting like prison guards now we have to have a new beginning we have to let the scholars start educating the people we have to uh, spread the religious knowledge this is the proper education in schools, in universities in, uh, at every level at work in various organizations in the streets because there is only one way that guarantees success Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not conceal it he actually declared it he said in surah Taha فَمَنِ اتَّبَعَ هُدَايَ فَلَا يَضِلُّ وَلَا يَشْقَى obviously I'm not saying we gotta apply the sharia tomorrow and cut off the hand of the thieves and all of that but gradually that we have a goal that we need to build up our society on an Islamic foundation. We need to educate ourselves, our rulers, our politicians, our professors, our children, the entire community about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about the halal and the haram. Then the expected results of being rightly guided will come as a result of this effort. So it is not simply getting rid of one entire regime and replacing it with another. Because if everything is still the same, then it would only take a year, two or three or four to create another tyrant regime or another pharaoh. We have to have a, 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 a plan. And the plan, we don't have to work hard in order to create it or develop it. Because it's already drawn. The blueprint has been uh, designed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by his prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is very good to be alert and aware of the plots of others in order to counter-attack them, in order to work hard to avoid them and protect our societies against these plots and not to forget. Nothing would hurt us except what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has preordained for us. And nothing can protect us against any evil better than a dua so let's all join hands and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect our Muslim ummah at large and free Muslims from the oppressors in every Muslim country and give us righteous rulers who would lead us on the straight path towards success Ameen Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Allah is my heart's speech, your mercy is what I beseech. Keep in my heart your remembrance and in your deen allow me to advance. Help me in my quest, permit me to pass the ultimate test. Help me in my quest, permit me to pass the ultimate test.